Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. It's Terry, your host. Um, so I dropped my load off in uh, Henderson, North Carolina. Just kind of um, on my 10 hour break here. Um, I found a sheets close by, parked here. Went inside, got me some uh, breakfast and uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna finish up this break and then I gotta head um, down over a little bit farther east, um, pick up a load that's going back to Missouri. Um, so on my way here, I went by a couple of things and I wanted to mention them because the, you know, like I read all the signs and um, <laughs> So I pay attention to where I am and I, I, you know, I'm always thinking about different stuff because that's just how my brain works. So um, I went through Farragut, Tennessee. And um, I've mentioned this before, but Farragut, Tennessee is actually named after the first admiral in the history of the U.S. Navy, David Glasgow uh, Farragut, because um, he was from Tennessee. Uh, he was raised, though, by the family uh, of a man named David Porter, who was a, who was a very well-known naval officer, whose son is David Dixon Porter, who was also a Navy admiral. Um, both Farragut and Porter were, the younger Porter, were admirals during um, the Civil War. But Farragut was the first Navy admiral. And you say, well, didn't... You know, didn't the Navy have admirals before, you know, like the 1860s? And the answer is sort of, but not really. So what what would happen is somebody would become a Commodore. And for example, um, Oliver Hazard Perry, who is known for his exploits during the uh, War of 1812, he was a Commodore. Um, but if somebody wanted to be a higher rank, and there is a higher rank than Commodore, what the U.S. Navy did was call them flag officers. And the term flag officer means, in today's Navy, anybody that's a Commodore or really a rear admiral lower half is what's called a one star. Um, Anybody that's a, a one star or above is considered a flag officer. But the reason we use the title flag officer was because it was kind of a rejection of the British Admiralty. And the British Admiralty was made up of admirals. And for the longest time, we didn't want to be associated with that. Um, uh, you know, it, but then at some point, I guess we were like more confident as a Navy or as a nation. And we were like, okay, yeah, we could have admirals. You know, it's a good term. It's a good title or whatever. Um, Cause like a lot of the stuff that we had is based on English law, English culture, English tran you know, traditions, including in the Navy. So anyway, that was Farragut. Here's a picture of him. And Farragut's the guy that was, he, he was famously named um, a Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers album, Damn the Torpedoes, when he said, um, Damn the Torpedoes, full speed ahead at the Battle of Mobile Bay in August of 1864. But here's the thing about torpedoes, right? When he said torpedoes, he was using the correct term, but, but torpedoes then were what we would call mines today. So they weren't, you know, motorized, you know, bombs that go through the water like from a submarine or a surface ship, but they were they were just stationary mines. But Mobile Bay was mined um, by the Confederates and it was one of the few ports that was still open at that point in the war cuz remember 8 August of 1864 we're only like 
six months away, seven months away from the Confederacy surrendering. So it was the only port that was still open um, for blockade runners in um, that brought, brought needed supplies to the Confederates because the Union Navy had blockaded all the other ports. So, but Mobile Bay was heavily defended and Farragut's the one that broke through the defenses with his with his squadron of ships and um, and um, defeated the Confederates so another person who came to mind when I was driving and this is actually not in Tennessee by the way Farragut's just west of Knoxville um, but this is in over in um, I don't know what county it's in but it it's over in western North Carolina um, in the foothills in the Piedmont um, I saw a sign for um, there's a bridge that says you know it's the Sam Irvin the third bridge and then later on you see another sign that says the Senator Sam Irvin jr. Uh, highway and so for those of you who wonder who all these Sam Irvins are they're all related they're all father, grandfather, great-grandfather. Um, but Sam Irvin Jr. was most famously probably he, um, a U.S. Senator. And he was the U.S. Senator. He was a Democrat from North Carolina. Um, old school Democrat. I guess we call him a blue dog Democrat today. But um, he ran the Senate Watergate Investigating Committee. And here's a picture of Senator Irvin. And Senator Irvin was this kind of like, you know, people call him folksy, country, whatever you want to say. Uh, he, he called himself a country lawyer, although he did go to Harvard Law School, graduated in 1922. But Senator Irvin, and I got to tell you, I remember these hearings. They took place in the summer of 1973. And, of course, there wasn't all the cable TV that we have today, but 70% of Americans watched some of these hearings. It was a huge deal. And at these Senate hearings, now there were also hearings in the House, because um, the House has to bring articles of impeachment and had Nixon been impeached it would have been you know the House that did that first um, and then he would have been tried in the Senate but Irvin um, conducts these hearings and he brings in all these people and just several times there were just bombshells at this hearing and one of the bombshells, there was a guy named Alexander Butterfield who was an assistant to the president. He reveals in testimony to the Senate committee that Nixon had this taping system to record conversations in the, in the Oval Office. And really, um, you know, Nixon would have gotten impeached in a, a about a year later because he left office in August of 74 and remember this is the summer of 73 um, but when they found about out about those tapes it was like okay we want those tapes and there was a big old fight about it and Nixon didn't want to give up the tapes and um, you know anyway th there was a big old fight about that but the other thing that came that the other testimony that I think was just this bomb were bombshells was John Dean's testimony. And John Dean was the counsel to the president, meaning the president's lawyer or the, the lawyer to the presidency, really. Um, and he revealed a lot of the conversations that he and Nixon had had. Um, but remember, he, he wasn't the president's lawyer. He was the lawyer of the office of the president. And uh, But anyway, you know, Nick, uh, Dean is the guy who said that there was a cancer upon the presidency. So those hearings were huge. Sam Irvin became really famous. Um, I mean, he was well-known here in North Carolina. He had been on the North Carolina Supreme Court. But 
Anyway, so if you see that on I-40, Sam Irvin, that's who he was. Sam Irvin III was his son who was a judge on the North Carolina Supreme Court. And now they're, uh, I think his grandson, Sam Irvin IV, is, uh, I think he's on the North Carolina Supreme Court now. Anyway, so that's that. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about OTIF loads and how to avoid um, service failures. So if you work at Prime, you probably have heard the term OTIF or on time in full. And this term is always associated, as far as I know, I've not heard it with any other um, receivers, any other consignee, but it's always associated with Walmart loads. And here's the thing, um, if uh, unless you've been under a rock or not had a Walmart load in a long, long time, you, you know that every time you get put on an OTIF load, um, you get like 30 messages reminding you that it's an OTIF load. In fact, the load I just dropped was one of those. And when I did my live loaded call, the first thing out of the lady's mouth, I can't, I think it was Beverly maybe, is, oh, you're on an OTIF load, you can't, you know, you have to, you know, and she starts telling me. Then my fleet manager calls me, but I missed a call because I'm out in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. I don't miss a call, I actually picked up, but he couldn't, uh, I, I didn't hear anything and then the line went dead. So he was calling me because then he sent me a message. He's like, hey, Terry, I was calling you because you're on an OTIF load. And so when anybody has an OTIF load, somebody at, at Prime Global Headquarters flips on the sweat pumps and usually they put them on, you know, emergency override so the pumps run no matter what. And they start sweating all over you. And in fact, I've had a few friends say, I feel like delivering this early um, just out of spite. And what I've done is sometimes the messages are so overwhelming that I start responding in a way that indicates that I will, I will screw this up. Now, I do think that what's happened is people have screwed this up. So let me just break down the OTIF stuff. OTIF is, is shorthand for you cannot show up for your appointment. So early is not good. Too, well, too early is not good. A little bit early is okay and advisable. And I'll tell you why. So here's the deal. You don't wanna be late for an appointment. Everybody knows that and that's pretty standard wherever you're delivering or picking up. You don't wanna be late for your appointment. But with these OTIF loads going to Walmart, you can't really be early either, right? There's a very tiny window that you have. You need to like, it's like a drop shot in uh, tennis or something, right? And it's, it's all about the finesse. So I had a load that was delivering at 0501 this morning. That meant that I could, if I showed up at 0400, that was a service failure because it was over an hour early. And it's super important to pay attention to the time, not just the 05 part, but how many minutes. Because sometimes it'll be like, it could have been 0520. If I show up at, at 415, I'm, I'm outside that hour window and that's a service failure. And the other thing that happens with the service failure is Walmart finds the shipper. The shipper is the one that pays Prime, but the, the shipper has conditions put on them by their customer who's Walmart. Walmart says, if you got a live unload at 0501, we don't want you on our property 
until 0401 at the earliest. Of course, I can't be late. I don't want to be late. But here's the other thing that can trip you up with these Walmart loads. And this is different than a lot of other places. So when every, every Walmart distribution center is a fairly sizable property, some are enormous and some are just big. And so when you show up at the gate, right, most of us get on our phones or maybe we get on Qualcomm and we check in, we say, yep, we're at the receiver. So you go in, you give them your paperwork, they print out the little stickers. It's a standard procedure at every Walmart. They print out the little stickers and then they say, go to this door. And you back in, you, at most Walmart distribution centers, you drop your landing gear and disconnect from the trailer, chalk your wheels, and then all of your bills of lading and any paperwork they gave you at the gate, then you walk that paperwork to the office. But here's the thing, the time you get that paperwork to the receiving office is when they consider you as being there. It doesn't matter that 30 minutes before you checked in while you were waiting at the gate or waiting in line at the gate, it, that doesn't matter. For Walmart's purposes, you are not present, even though your truck is already parked in one of their doors and theoretically they could already be unloading it, you're not present at Walmart until you have checked in at the receiving office. Now, the reason why all this matters is because, remember I told you this is a lob shot, right? You gotta lob it in there at the right time. So. You can't show up more than an hour early, but you don't want to show up at Walmart 10 minutes before your appointment and think you're going to have an on-time delivery. And here's the reason, because you have to get into the office after you've already backed your truck in. Now, truthfully, some people, like if, if they don't have a door for you, now this is if they assign you a door. and. I would say nine times out of 10, I get a door assignment at the security checkpoint. But if you don't get a door assignment, that's okay. Then you just go park and walk your stuff in. You don't have to back into the door. But if you get a door assignment, you gotta get in the door first, right? You gotta do all that stuff, disconnect all that before you go in the office. So OTIF load, you wanna get there you know, 45 minutes, 50 minutes before your appointment, right? That's the lob shot, right? It puts you in, you're in the window, right? But that also gives you enough time to get through the gate, drive whatever, 10 miles an hour, back into a door, be careful, you know, there'll be other people around. Like for instance, I got to my location about 46 minutes early, I think it was right at 4.15 that I got there. Well, there were a bunch of trucks in line, which is a little kind of unusual, but part of it was they only had one person working the gate. Um, and you know, I noticed that when I finally got in there. I did make it on time, but I could tell you that, so I got there at 4.15, I didn't get in the office until 4.52. Um, that's after I backed my truck into a door, disconnected, and then I walked all the way down there. Now some drivers, I saw a guy that he drove his bobtail down to the office and just, you know, flew up like, <laughs> I think he was running late because when I was coming out of the office, this dude, he was from, um, I think it's A&A, &A, they're out of Brandon, South Dakota, uh, but, uh, but he he was like came screeching up to the, like he just basically parked where the bob where the uh jockeys park he 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 was like he didn't give a f you know so anyway i i share all this with you because you know it's important to prime but here's the thing and i am a little surprised cuz you know my reaction to getting these messages when it's 
you know, common sense. I'm like, why do I have to read messages like this? Why do I have to get these calls? And the answer is <clears throat> the same thing with anything in trucking. It's because other truckers have screwed it up. And, and candidly, when we're talking about this stuff, we're talking about other truckers at Prime. Other Prime drivers have screwed this up. And I thought, <coughs> excuse me, I thought, how hard can this be? But here's what happened. I was in Salt Lake just like a couple weeks ago, right? I'm talking to this dude, Howard's his name. Hey, Howard. Um, he's a trainee, he's a TNT trainee. And he and his trainer had a load earlier. They were getting ready to leave with a different load, but they had had a, a load earlier to the Corrine or Corrine, yeah, anyway, Corrine, Utah, um, Walmart. And apparently they had stopped at the Salt Lake City Terminal before that, and somebody there was like, oh yeah, you, they don't care if you come early. <laughs> well, that's this is the other insidious thing, right? It's actually, they'll let you come in early. They don't, they'll, they'll accept you, right? But you're falling prey to a trap, right? Because they'll let you come in an hour earlier than you're supposed to. So maybe two hours before your appointment, right? But then they're going to fine, and I don't know what the fine is. I think it's 500 bucks. They're going to fine the shipper. And guess what the shipper's going to do? Hello, Prime? Hey, thanks for costing us 500 bucks, you jack wagons. Don't fall for it. One hour early or less and give yourself enough time to get to the office before your scheduled appointment time and keep track of the time, okay? There's still apparently people out there that cannot get this, right? If it's an OTIF load, you cannot show up more than an hour early. You just can't. I mean, you can, but it's gonna cost 500 bucks. And I'm pretty sure that Prime is gonna end up paying it and if, you know, if you're a lease operator, you're probably going to end up paying it or own, you know, a lease purchase. If you're a company driver, I don't know what they're going to do, but I guarantee they're not going to, it's going to go down as a service failure and they're not going to be happy no matter who you are, no matter what your status is with the company. So don't fall for any traps. And if anybody tells you, oh yeah, you, that Walmart, that Walmart, you could show up early. And here's the thing, the people at the gate, they don't, they probably don't even know what I'm telling you. They don't care, right? It's not, it, 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 it's not something they would worry about. They're just like, oh yeah, he had a five o'clock appointment. He showed up at 345. Yeah, I'm good with that, right? They don't care. They're just checking people in. They're just doing their job. And probably even the people in the office don't care. They're just putting times down. But somebody cares. Somebody at Walmart corporate in Bentonville, Arkansas is like, oh, this prime person showed up uh, an hour and two minutes before their appointment. Cha-ching, 500 bucks, please. So don't fall for it. Don't get a service failure. And, and you know... Hopefully everybody will get this message. And one other thing, we all know the about the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. I can tell you from having advised businesses over the years, from having been a customer and hiring vendors and, and all sorts of stuff, it's not one screw up that loses you a customer, okay? It's not one screw up right? It's maybe not even 10 screw ups, but eventually, right? Like, let's say that we have OTIF loads from Chobani, for example. I'll just use them, right? If Chobani get, even though Chobani may not, you know, get, end up eating the $500 fine and Prime actually eats it, eventually, if, you know, if we're talking you know, it ha it's happening 20 times a month, eventually Chobani is gonna be like, you know what, Prime? We're, because there's a frictional cost to dealing with this, right? You know, Chobani has choices, right? 
Like, we're not the only refrigerated carrier in America, right? And I'm sure somebody, all the business that we have at Chobani or any, any place else, there's, there's somebody else that's willing to take that business, right? And, you know, at, at some point, a customer might say, you know what, we're sick and tired of hearing about this, you know? We're sick and tired of hearing about it we're just gonna go find another carrier. And you don't wanna be the person that contributes to that, right? Because when, when a, it's, it's way, 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 way harder to replace a customer than it is to keep one. And that's true in business across the board, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's way harder to replace a customer. And it's way harder to get that trust back um, so, you know, if you're a driver at Prime, don't be the person that ruins that relationship. Because even if, even if it didn't seem like a big deal to you, it could end up being a big deal to everybody. You know, it could, you know, because we, if we lose one customer, you know, that's millions of dollars in revenue a year. And it's thousands of dollars in revenue to a lot of different drivers. So don't be that person that ruins it for everybody. Um, it's a competitive marketplace at all times, but it's particularly competitive right now. Um, and I will say that Prime does a pretty good job of, of keeping the rates where they are and, you know, because we, we have a good reputation. But having a good reputation is is a double-edged sword because it, it doesn't take much to ruin one um, and you know it, it, it's a it's a huge benefit but it doesn't take much to ruin one so don't be that last straw on that camel's back anyway talk to you later bye